Hello, I'm Elaine Christie from Western Australia, Rockingham. And if you look at the, um, I'll try and practice my little bit. See that word there? That's a very important word in what I'm about to tell you. Um, this, this is an example of, of uh, 13 years of collecting data in Rockingham. Uh, we're Rockingham Basic Grass Monitoring Group. And we're citizen scientists. We're not scientists at all. So the, the scientists and hopefully helped us. So I'll move on. This is an example of one of our study sites. You can see the, the boot scars and the anchor drag, which is one of them, and, and part of a Posidonia australis. The group generated meaningful scientific information despite receiving no support and having good and bad survey years. If citizen science is to work, it must be supported by local, state, and federal governments had method protocols, starter storage and results been properly supported and integrated into natural resource management agencies, the group's information would have been substantially helpful to science and management. The site results, we had five sites, each with four um, um, compass roses in them. Betcher Point grew, others were mixed up and down, and one set generally lost seagrass cover, like a due to physical disturbance such as anchor drag. Uh, there was, and climate change. The history of seagrass loss, 4,000 hectares in 1967 and 1999, 900 hectares, which is a tragedy. Rockingham Bay was established in 2001 through a PhD student and the aim was to help study seagrasses and describe seagrasses in areas proposed for marina development or historically reduced areas. After six months, the student absconded with our startup funds, so we were with <laughs> the right research and government support methods changed from quantitative to qualitative. The linear transects with the beautiful seagrass meadows from 2001 to 2003 was actually for the Western Australians, which was in front of Penguin Island. And then it changed to seagrass patches. We were very lucky to get a grant in 2003, but it was contingent on having a trained program manager to supervise. So the data was consistent and recorded with WA State Calm Marine Monitoring Program. 2004 was a very successful year because we were confident and guided into patch dynamics. This area of WA coastline is either linear with beautiful seagrass meadows or it has discrete seagrass patches. The monitor is now focused on patch growth and the loss and link to changes in general water quality to see if changes in patches can be triggers for management attention. Some more examples is, i practice my thing. There we are, eight line trumpeter. Beautiful example of um, a nudibranch and gorgeous sea enamel over the other side. And you can see the degraded um, Posidonia australis and that looks a bit like Signoris' must be mixed up in there, Marion, <laughs> if you hear. <laughs> um, we had five locations starting with John Point, the very top, and then Mangles Bay, which was in Coburn Sound, moving to Point Perrin, Penguin Island, and Betcher Point, they're all in Shorewater Marine Park. These are our methods. At the beginning up here, the, the, oh, sorry, the last up there, oh. Um, the, the last up in the top corner, um, we had to look for our compass rose, which was, was on uh, a track brake drum. <laughs> um, we had eight measurements from the center of the, the, um, secret, the, the um, compass rose, and then we did quadrats, four quadrats, north, south, east, and west, one meter back from the central 
part. Uh, we also measured um, semi-quantitative data, sparse 80% bare, medium 50% uh, bare, and dense 20% bare. I know that was by visual analysis, and also epiphyte abundance by visual analysis too, and we took digital photographs as well. These are a graph of, of the growth and decline of our seagrass meadows. As you can see, Betcher Point was, was a, one of the best sites, very steady growth. Penguin Island is, is an area of very um, uh, high tourism, boats and glass bottom boats and ferries backwards and forwards. So you can see that it's quite um, um, degraded in areas. Point Perrin is not consistent. John Point was our very deep site, um, and it was, did grow, but very slowly. And Mangles Bay, I have to tell you that, that one, site one, three, and four were um, measured, the reverse, measured from the sand to the seagrass patch. Site two was the only one that was, it was a discrete uh, seagrass patch because we couldn't find any properly because we had to have them between five and ten meters from another one so it made it rather awkward. This is some more example you can see the anchor drag, lignium fibers, um, a, a scuba diver, very deep site. Mangles Bay uh, was um, very, we, we chose that particularly because from the time we've been doing it there's been uh, moves to make it a marina there. So obviously our research data was very important. And I have to tell you that in April 2018, the marina has been stopped. <laughs> so we're very proud of that. Um, very heavy epiphyte cover, and you can see it's quite degraded. Um, and this is a patch. There's lots of boat moorings there. Oops, there, oh sorry, I forgot to bring that up. <laughs> I do apologize. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the computers made with me. <laughs> um, um, the, you can see it reduced in time. This, this is patch four, which is a reverse patch. So it's actually from the sand to the edge of the seagrass. Penguin Island, there are between five and 800 pairs of penguins and uh, this is quite a, a degraded area. Um, it's, it's, um, um, they don't feed here, they, they breed here. So it's, it's, um, it has, it's, very, it's very, lots of storms there and, and it's quite difficult. And that's E3, so that it's E3 um, for our site. Betcher Point, excellent. It's one of the best sites that we had uh, good quality, but um, it's, a, it's a feeding ground for the, the penguins of the white bait. But in later years, uh, we found that the, it's not so good, and we don't know why the season's not as good as what it used to be. So, unfortunately, the penguins are foraging much further afield, and sometimes as far as, as Bunbury, which is two and a half hours' drive away. So, you can see how that will affect the penguin population. Oh, sorry, I keep forgetting to do that. Uh, comparison of the seagrass over time. So you can see it's a great, that was one of our great sites. We're very thrilled with that one. And then Point Perrin is um, a deep site. Um, it's, it's pretty good, but it's not, it's erratic. It doesn't grow consistently. And that's a beautiful example of the viviporous flowering Posidonia australis. Oh, and a new, um, that we think those are snail eggs at the bottom there. John Point. And John Point was quite a, an exposed site, and we chose it purposefully because it is sort of outside more in the open sea. The patches were discreet, but no measurements for three seasons because we had trouble finding the, the um, compass rose. <laughs> There's an example of our quadrat too. So it grew slowly but steadily. 
Right, and, and as you can see, these are the boat. We had to, we never hired a boat. We always had a boat. Took a while to find it. Um, there are five in the boat, one to record, uh, two, two deep um, scuba divers, and the shallow divers there. Right, the conclusions and recommendations. We were successful because the group produced interesting management data on local seagrass dynamics for 10 years. And the data now is being archived with metadata statement being developed. The data could have been more substantial and valuable if scientific government assistance had been available. The government loss of attention was a problem. We were very cross about it. We started with calm, we went to depot, then uh, deck, and then the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attraction. So uh, in, whenever they changed that, people disappeared. So, so to look after us, we got a bit more critical. We had phantom national databases. I went down into Perth to try and find out where our data had gone, and I located this guy, and he said, well, I'm very sorry, he said, because um, I haven't got any time assigned to look after your data. So that was another tragedy too. And then um, we always had a great number of volunteers. Our actual group was fantastic. Up to 64 people used to beg us to go out in the, in the ocean. Um, we always had uh, the boat. We always managed to get hold of a boat, sometimes two. And it's crucial they've always got two scuba divers for the deep sites. But while our um, scientific volunteer and pot was lacking, the attitude of volunteers was always good. <laughs> 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 Training and provision of relevant sampling protocols were essential to maintain consistent, consistent sampling methods. The group only trained once, so we never had any training. And then uh, the training was, was inconsistent as veteran volunteers retired. And it wasn't compatible with Eastern States, you know, like Seagrass Watch. And um, we, we've managed to get hold of a guy and helped us, but it was too late. Everybody's sort of getting a bit tired about it all. <laughs> Times and insurance have changed too, because, you know, we can now go water half a metre deep. And uh, thank you to Paul. <laughs> um, we've service costs our, um, how much it, the savings to government. 9,500 for our group for 10 years. 120,000 um, government it would have cost the equivalent. So we saved them $120,000. There you go. <laughs> and I'd, li um, I'd like to thank... Um, Let's go. Oh, I know. We were very lucky to have Fremantle ports because, of course, we were left out on a limb. So we, we used to have to scrabble for money. And Fremantle ports came. I used to whiz down there and say, please come have some money. And they give us about every two years $2,000. So, so it was brilliant. And the only thing that I had to do was go and present to them when they had their meetings to see what the state of the seagrass was. <laughs> so it was brilliant. <laughs> so, um, so I can't tell you enough about our dedicated volunteers. We're actually a little core of five of us, but then we all got quite old. But we, we just love the, the young people. They were absolutely brilliant. You know, they came along. And there's, there's John Staten, I think. Didn't you come? Are you here? Uh, right. I think, he came, I think he was a volunteer. So there's many people, John Staten, Ian Dapson, you know, and they've become scientists. So um, I, I just want to tell you, I really loved it. It was just great, but it's very hard work. And it would have been a lot better if we'd have had help for the... I mean, my, my biggest criticism is the government departments don't set aside time for the scientists to help us. You know, and that's the sad thing, because this is very valuable study. All right, so that's the end. <laughs> 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 oh. uh, oh,
Okay, thank you very much for your very honest... Uh, yes, well, it has to be. <laughs> ...your honest perspective on what occurred and the challenges that you faced. Yeah. Unfortunately, we are running a little right. bit short on time, so I'm quite sure if people have some questions, they can take it up with Elaine yeah, definitely. during lunchtime. Yeah, because it, it, it does work, but you just have to... The government in Japan, to whatever it is, and the, and the scientists keep them on task. <laughs> oh. Okay, I'd like...